Give me Jesus, Lord. Give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Just give me Jesus. Amen. You know, when I think about this scene uh, that we that Nancy read to us in the Gospel of John, I can't help but imagine what must be, be what must have been going through the minds of the disciples. In the chapter in John just before this, we have Jesus' final discourse. With the public, that is the final message that he was sending out to those who were there following him and listening to him. And the message that he was giving was about being a servant. And he also said to them, I will be with you only a little while longer. Now, the disciples are gathering with Jesus in this private setting in an upper room. And I wonder how many of them thinking back of what he said in that public setting. I wonder how many of you thought that, well, this just means that Jesus is going to leave Jerusalem and go back to Galilee. And there we're going to continue the ministry that we've been doing for these past three years. I wonder if any of them had the clue that this was going to be the very last meal that they were going to have with Jesus. Now, we have the blessing of knowing the, the story. But these disciples, they at that moment, they didn't actually know what was going on. You know, they had been with Jesus three years. They had seen him do all kinds of miraculous things. He was a great preacher and teacher and prophet. And so when he says, I'm not going to be with you very long, much longer, I wonder how many really believed him. I wonder how many of them just didn't understand. Jesus took his outer robe off. And he poured water in a basin, and he took a towel and wrapped it around him. And I bet there were some questioning eyes around there looking at him. What in the world is going on here? Because this was not the way it was supposed to be. You know, Jesus was not supposed to be the one washing feet. A rabbi, a teacher, would never do that, would never be asked to do that. But here is Jesus getting ready to do it. But nobody says anything until Jesus gets down on the floor and he begins to put the water, pour the water on their feet and to take that towel and to wash them. And Peter who is sort of a leader in the disciples, is questioning this. This is, not, this is not how it's supposed to be. But Jesus continues on in this act of servanthood, in this tremendous act of humility. And then he says to Peter, Peter, you do not understand now. But later, you will understand. There's something quietly disorienting about somebody who shows that kind of humility, isn't it? We don't know what to think about it when we confront somebody who engages in servanthood, who humbles themselves and thinks more of the other than of themselves. We certainly don't see a lot of it being demonstrated out there in the world today, and we don't see it very much in those who are leaders. Those who are to be the servant leaders 
towards others. Humility is not a quality that we see, but Jesus is letting us know that this is how we should be. You know, I've always believed that when all of the talking heads and all of the loudest voices finally quiet down, that it's going to be these, these silent acts of servitude and humility that are the ones that really rise to the surface. Jesus says, you do not know what I'm doing, but you will understand. One of my uh, great stories, or favorite stories, about genuine servanthood and humility comes out of the life of the great African-American leader, Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington was, was a slave. He was born into slavery. He was finally freed from slavery when he was nine years old. But he rises to become the president of Tuskegee University, and he became an advisor to presidents. Very well respected and renowned African American in a time when most African Americans weren't even thought of. Well, the story is that Booker T. Washington was walking through an affluent neighborhood. And in this neighborhood, there's this white woman who steps out and stops him. And she said to him, she didn't recognize him, she didn't know who he was. She said to him, if you're looking for a job, I've got some wood that I'd like to have chopped in my backyard, and you do it, I'll give you a couple of dollars. Now I imagine that we probably wouldn't do that. Nor would we ask the president of a university to do that. But I love what Booker, Booker T. Washington did. He, he said, well, you know, I think I'd like to do that. I'd like to spend some time here in the blazing sun. And he goes her backyard, he picks up the axe, takes off his jacket, he begins chopping that wood. And this incident would probably have gone unnoticed, un, you know, unreported, except there was uh, a servant girl in this woman's home who recognized him, who recognized him as the president of Tuskegee University. And, you know, when Booker T. Washington Fish, he went back. The next day, he was there in his office at the university. He was doing some important work there. And all of a sudden, he gets a knock on the door. And it's, it's that woman. And she is apologizing left and right. She said, I'm sorry. I didn't know who you were. I didn't recognize you. I would certainly never have asked you to chop wood if I had known who you were. And I love what Booker T. Washington said. He says, Madam, it is perfectly all right. I love doing manual labor every now and then. And then he added, and besides, it's always a delight to do something for a friend. That woman became his friend. And she made immense financial contributions to the school. And not only that, she went out and got a lot of her very wealthy friends to make contributions to Tuskegee University. That simple act of being the servant, that simple act of going out there, you know, with a with a humble attitude and, and chopping that wood, 
I can hear the words of Jesus. You do not know what I am doing, but soon you will understand. That quiet action by Booker T. Washington that was transformative for that woman and for her prejudiced heart. As the water, he poured the water over each of the disciples' feet, they began to realize there's something different about the master's behavior here. But when they said they did not want Jesus to wash their feet, Jesus says to them, if you don't let me wash your feet, you're not a part of me. You see, there's something vital in this act. That there is something about this act that defines Jesus' ministry. He said, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done for you. This act of quiet humility there in that upper room had the power to transform and to be an example for the leaders of the ancient world. Not to mention to be an example for leaders today. You see, my beloved, unless we manifest this love, unless we manifest this humility and servant-like attitude that Jesus displayed there in the upper room that last night with his disciples, then we really don't understand what Jesus was doing. After Jesus had finished washing the disciples' feet, he stood up, he put on his outer cloak, and then he challenges the disciples to understand. He told them that it's not enough to know that you are to wash another's feet, but you are only blessed if you do it. It is the actual act of service, not the act of studying it, or like we do here in the Methodist Church, we form a committee to try to make a decision about whether we should wash somebody's feet. It is only after we do it, put the love into action, put the service into action, to be humble in what we are doing, we are missing what Jesus is trying to teach us in this act there in the upper room. And then he gives us the commandment. Love one another, which becomes, as I told you earlier, the mandate, the Monday for us here on Monday, Thursday. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And in the same way, that Jesus once simplified 613 commandments in the Old Testament and narrowed them down to two, love God, love one another. So too Jesus shows a radically simplistic vision for what it means to be one of his disciples in this world. But without putting it into practice, then we are missing the final charge that Jesus gave to his disciples. We are called to make love manifest. That's our call. We are called to make love manifest. There's a famous poem by St. Teresa of Avila, who was a 16th century nun, who was this amazing writer of spiritualism and of uh, 
mysticism. And she wrote something that beautifully fits this command of Jesus there in the upper room to his disciples. The mandate, the mandate. It's entitled, Christ Has No Body. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on your own earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks upon this world with compassion. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. As we prepare to celebrate a meal, as we come to this table remembering that we are Christ's body in this earth now, let us remember the meal and the message that Jesus gave us and gave to his disciples on that night. May the, the bread and the cup remind us of the tremendous sacrifice that Jesus made for us, what we are going to remember tomorrow on Good Friday. And may we make love manifest just as God made love manifest in the giving of Christ. Thanks be to God for this love to which we are called. Amen.